I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We spend the rest of the hour with one of the nation's most celebrated writers, Rebecca Solnit. This month marks the 10th anniversary of her groundbreaking essay, Men Explain Things to Me. In 2008, Solnit wrote, quote, Men explain things to me and other women whether or not they know what they're talking about. Every woman knows what I'm talking about. It's the presumption that makes it hard at times for any woman in any field, that keeps women from speaking up and from being heard when they dare, that crushes young women into silence by indicating, the way harassment on the street does, that this is not their world. It trains us in self-doubt and self-limitation, just as it exercises men's unsupported overconfidence. Solnit wrote those words a decade ago, long before the Me Too and Time's Up movements swept across the country. The essay has also been credited with launching the, team, the term mansplaining, though Rebecca Solnit did not coin that phrase. For more, we're joined now by Rebecca Solnit, writer, historian, activist, author of 20 books, including Hope in the Dark and, most recently, The Mother of All Questions. Rebecca Solnit is a contributing editor at Harper's, where she's the first woman to regularly write the Easy Chair column. Rebecca, welcome. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. So, the effect of this essay that you wrote, um, oh, 10 years ago, men explained things to me, and the effect that's had. And um, you're now, your focus on writing, as it always has been, on movements, how this feeds into your understanding of the power of movements. I've always thought of feminism as a subset of human, a human rights movement about sort of inclusion and equality. And so, yeah, so this essay was about a way women are severely impacted by being treated as not credible, as not people who have something to say, as people whose voices shouldn't count, whether they're saying, this is what's going on, you know, in the office, or, no, I don't want to have sex with you, or he's trying to kill me. It's funny, because I started writing what I, with the famous opening anecdote about a man explaining my book to me, writing what I thought was going to be a very lightweight or a very funny piece, and it got pretty quickly into rape and murder. Credibility is a basic survival issue. Well, in a recent Harper's piece, you write a very uh, something that's very striking, uh, saying it's an old truism that knowledge is power. The inverse, that power is often ignorance, is rarely discussed. You go on to say there's a large category of acts hidden from people with standing. The more you are, the less you know. So, could you explain uh, uh, what you meant by that and how that applies specifically to what you just said, uh, the impunity with which men are able to act and the ways in which women have been silenced? Yeah, and I wrote that column thinking about everybody, servants, children, subordinates, employees, people of color who are treated as people who aren't important, who aren't witnesses, whose voices don't count, who often have people do things that they assume are off the record because these people will not be heard. And, of course, my own experience with that is, as a woman, where it's like, oh, nobody will believe her that I did this. Um, I can just talk over her and say it didn't happen. So, you know, so, again, I'm trying to think about the broader spectrum of how inequality of power... Well, could you talk about that, your own experience um, with sexual harassment, as you uh, uh, describe it in the Harper's piece? Well, you know, I've had a, thousands of incidents on the street when I was a young woman, uh, but I wrote about something that happened to me when I was 18 and a restaurant worker. And I know, like farm workers, restaurant workers have a really high incidence of sexual harassment, and I wasn't an exception. There was this kind of scary old chef a uh, bleary alcoholic with bloodshot eyes who used to grab me when I was trying to wash the dishes in a cafe. And at that time, this was before Anita Hill changed the playing field a little bit, before some of the transformations we've had in the last few decades. I didn't believe, and I think I was accurate, that anybody was going to care, that my boss was going to care that this guy was grabbing me. And so what I actually did was made sure that, you know, one of the, you know, month, weeks or months into this happening, that when he grabbed me, I was holding a big tray of uh, glasses right out of the dishwasher, and I screamed and dropped them. And the noise I made didn't really matter. I didn't really have a voice at that point. But the glasses had a voice. The sound of, you know, 40 shattering glasses brought the owner running. And I just said, he grabbed me. And, uh, you know, and the owner told off the chef, 
not so much because my I should have the right to have jurisdiction over my own body, but because losing a whole tray full of glasses was expensive. And the, the cook was really annoyed, because he knew that I'd essentially tricked him. But it was, you know, it was how I tried to have a voice when I was voiceless. Rebecca, speaking of voicelessness, you know, the latest scandal of the White House involves the allegation that President Trump was involved with an adult film star, um, Stormy Daniels. The issue isn't so much that, it's that he's trying to silence her. That's the allegation. And, um, you know, that she would have to pay a million dollars if she speaks about this. What is your take on this? Everything from that to overall the Me Too and Times Up movement about sexual harassment and rape? Well, one of the things that should be said, and uh, probably a lot of people know, is that non-disclosure agreements are a really common part of su uh, corporate settlements, but also kind of sexual violence settlements. They're sometimes imposed on uh, college students in uh, by the university. They're often enforced uh, in civil lawsuits. For example, the wo woman who charged Dominique Strauss-Kahn with rape um, received a settlement. She has a wonderful restaurant in the Bronx that she started. I've eaten at. She started out with the result. And that, that's amazing. But, a hotel worker who challenged yes. one of the most powerful men, former head of the IMF, is that right? Who would, yes. well, could have become the president of France. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an amazing case that she was able to be heard. And she was, of course, attacked. She also successfully sued uh, a mainstream media outlet that claimed she was a prostitute. And, um, you know, and she was... People attempted to silence her by discrediting her, calling her a prostitute, saying, why should we listen to her? And... Um, but a number of other women came forward because of her courage and also talked about sexual violence and Dominique Strauss-Kahn and ended his career and destroyed his reputation, which deserved to be destroyed. But she did sign a non-disclosure agreement. What Stormy Daniels signed is a really tr typical thing that's one of myriad techniques for silencing women, and uh, something that I think maybe shouldn't exist. I, it's not a victory if part of what you have to settle for is being silent. It perpetrates the problem, which is that when you said no, when you said this is not what should happen, you were silenced. Well, Rebecca, as you said, your own experience, and as the Me Too movement shows, yeah. I mean, this, the experience of sexual harassment, of silencing, uh, uh, and, and even rape, is uh, very, very widespread. What do you think accounts for the fact that this movement took off in the way that it did, uh, with the, the revelations around Harvey Weinstein? You know, I think that this movement was a long time in coming, and I think it's like the gun movement we're seeing now, that there is one specific thing, the shooting in Parkland, Harvey, the revelations. Journalists uncovered about Harvey Weinstein's decades of horrific uh, assaults and attacks on, on women. But the ground had been prepared. With the gun movement, we had used up all the excuses and justifications and evasions, all the thoughts and prayers. With the women's movement, also, I think one factor was that women are really fed up, and we've seen that the last five years, because this movement goes back way beyond uh, Me Too. It goes to campus rape activism in 2012 and a lot of other stuff that's happened in the last five years. Uh, but... And I think it also happened because some of the slow, boring, uh, you know, work of feminism that doesn't get noticed, creating women who are in charge of what the news is, women who are judges, women who are producers, women who have uh, positions of power, um, helped change who gets heard and what stories matter and whose rights matter. I think that we, you know, we'd had stories like this before that didn't resonate didn't lead to a lot of other men being fired, didn't lead to recognition that this is a systemic problem. So were you surprised? I'm always surprised that this is the, you know, the time, because, like, who knew that the Parkland shooting would be di different than every other school shooting, that we'd focus on their survivors and their beautiful voices rather than the dead and the killer? 
you know, so I, I was and I wasn't. And, you know, these things happen like earthquakes, long building of tension, kind of laying of groundwork, and then a sudden rupture. We're going to have to break, but we're going to go to part two, and we're going to post online at democracynow.org our conversation with Rebecca Solnit, writer, historian, activist. She'll be speaking at Cooper Union tonight um, on this 10th anniversary of Men Explain Things to Me. That does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks for joining us.